All right. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Ellen Solaris. I am, for the next couple of weeks, the president of the Minnesota Public Health Association. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Antonia Apolinario Wilcoxon will be moving into the president role after me, which is very exciting. I am also very excited to be having this presentation today. We're going to be talking about community health innovation, focusing on the Mankato Community Health Worker Hub with, spoiler alert, my colleague, Evan Curtin, who's the director of Welfare International's Mankato office. So a couple reminders, please mute your microphone when you're not talking. Totally up to you if you want to have your camera on or not. Uh, we also welcome people adding their pronouns into their name if you'd like. For those of you who may not be familiar, our pronouns are the words that folks use when they're referring to us other than their names. So for example, my pronouns are she, her, hers. So you could say, Ellen is speaking or she is speaking. Totally fine either way. I will be keeping track of questions in the chat um, throughout the presentation. We'll save time for questions at the end. You can either put them to everyone or you could you know, direct message them to me. Either way is fine. We have about an hour for a presentation and we're planning on 10-ish, 15-ish minutes for questions at the end. As we do at all of our events, I'm gonna read our ancestral land statement, which was developed in partnership with American Indian leaders and our health equity community. We ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long standing history and connection to the land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and United States governmental policies, but they persevered. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people as well as the land itself. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass the proverbial microphone to Evan. Thanks so much, Ellen, and uh, honor to be here today. Thank you guys very much for your interest in um, this project that we've been uh, running for a few years now. Um, I'm gonna walk through this um, slideshow. As Ellen said, uh, please feel free to um, uh, put those questions in the chat or send them to her so that uh, we can have them at the end. Um, and uh, I'll get started right now. I'll start sharing my screen. All right. Can everybody see this as a slideshow? Sometimes it stops working. Yep, I can see Perfect. it just fine. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is about a rural CHW collaborative in Minnesota that is uh, led by Welsh International in my office down here. Um, we have had a long history of partnership and uh, uh, leadership in the CHW space, um, and uh, there is a lot of innovation that that um, has been taking place in this field, not just with us, but with a few other folks um, across the state. And so we want to acknowledge that as we move forward. This partnership itself is a partnership between the Mankato Clinic, Welsh International, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. In addition, um, UCARE has joined uh, the uh, uh, group as well, um, but the founding members are uh, listed below here. So just a little bit on Welshire International. Um, we have been uh, operating for about 40 years uh, internationally and domestically. Um, so to give the context here that's actually pretty important uh, is that we um, operated overseas in uh, traditionally low resourced uh, countries in terms of medical care. We learned about the role and the scope of practice that CHWs uh, can provide. And we took that uh, information and knowledge back to serve people in Minnesota. Um, so basically this is a innovation from um, 
the uh, developing world that has now moved um, over to uh, assist us in the United States. Um, we have been running uh, community health workers uh, in Minnesota for more than 20 years and um, have been utilizing them in uh, uh, immigrant and refugee communities primarily, um, and now uh, with this pro project moving on to uh, other populations as well. So we'll go through that. Um, in terms of the basics of CHWs, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, how CHWs work, but the basic idea is because they do have a very wide scope of practice, as we're going to see in this presentation, um, they increase access to effective use of healthcare. So uh, increasing knowledge and um, helping navigation through healthcare systems, which we all know can be quite complex, um, and uh, educating and enabling improved prevention. Uh, so preventative illness uh, education in native languages, if necessary, um, overcoming uh, any cultural linguistic barriers. But we've actually found this to be quite useful uh, for folks who uh, speak English and were born in the US as well. Again, it's a very complicated system. Um, addressing social determinants of health, so working through uh, uh, some of those things that people can focus on their health care or as a benefit of addressing those social determinants, enjoy uh, greater health outcomes. And then uh, finally, save money for people and care and payer systems. So when CHWs are involved, generally speaking, um, patients, uh, hospitals and payer systems all save money. In terms of our past, uh, we are regarded as the pioneer for uh, community health worker model in Minnesota. We've been working on this for many years. And again, uh, this map here on the right is showing a little bit about uh, the places where we've worked and learned uh, this model in the past. And just in terms of, I know this is a, a group of folks who study uh, a lot of different things, um, I'll send this out, but there are a lot of references regarding um, the use of CHWs in their wide scope of practice and how that helps uh, uh, folks in the future. Um, so in terms of long-term ROI, um, pretty much anywhere you use a CHW, it will uh, save money and have a better health outcome for those people involved if the program is correctly set up. Uh, I only just want to share this because it's very important as we are talking about how CHWs can be used. Um, there are going to be uh, other factors at play here than just our desire to help people, right? And so having this information out here that's very well supported, uh, there are many more since this has been drafted, um, really shows that uh, uh, CHWs um, assist with uh, uh, cost savings in the future. And in this next slide, uh, talking about um, the uh, uh, areas in which health was positively impacted for patients uh, in these uh, various areas. And I'll send this, uh, or Ellen will send this out in the end. So um, those of you who like reading up footnotes to, to uh, be able to uh, engage a little bit more, uh, you can feel free to do that. Um, so as we have sort of a scope of practice for CHWs that is very broad, um, there are two programs that I'm going to highlight today that we uh, focus on in Mankato. So these are going to be really just um, highlight two of the different ways in which CHWs can be used to positive effect. So project well-being is the first thing that we're going to talk about today. This is a collaborative launch between Blue Cross Blue Shield, Mankato Clinic, and WellShare. Um, the, group, the idea behind this is that the initial focus of every interaction is solving uh, social determinants of health issues in order to address health needs. So moving people up that Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that they can get to a space where they can address their health needs. Um, we um, have multiple uh, linguistic and cultural proficiencies uh, in our um, uh, group here. So we have CHWs from the Somali uh, Spanish. We have a contractor who assists from the newer community, as we saw the need. And then we have somebody who is a dedicated English speaker, um, which is a new sort of space for CHWs to use that we've tested and found to be very useful. Um, so it's very important to point out that this program, it is uh, uh, focused around eliminating health disparities. Um, there is a component of it that works uh, uh, to eliminate health disparities among immigrant and refugee populations, but uh, a, a large amount of the people that are being served by this program are um, folks who were born in America, speak English, African American, Caucasian, so they are being served by this program as well. And we've kind of discovered that there's a unique unduplicated scope of practice for CHWs as we go, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. 
They really serve as force multipliers for nurse care managers and social workers. So um, when they're working with those uh, folks in this clinical system, it works very well and it allows that these um, team members uh, uh, of the treatment teams to be much more uh, successful. And then we learned that there are some unique uh, issues in a rural setting. So increased transportation issues, uh, those are an issue everywhere, but there, there is no public transportation uh, to speak of in most of the areas that we're serving down here. And in addition, people are more geographically dispersed. Um, there is a huge lack of culturally specific care uh, and lack of translators down here. So we have had patients, unfortunately, waiting, um, you know, hours to get an appropriate translator to receive medical care. Um, and in terms of culturally specific care, uh, there is very little to choose from down here. So um, in the metro area, I, I'm sure those of you who practice there understand that it's not perfect in any area of the state, but it is a much larger barrier down here. So this is kind of our idea of our model of working uh, with our patients. So we very frequently are referred patients who um, need that first level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs met, food and shelter. Um, many of our patients have are food insecure or um, unhoused uh, when we first meet with them, not a majority, but, but some. And obviously we can't be talking about preventative um, medical visits if that's where they're at. So we are gonna work on that first. Um, most of our patients as we come through are um, dealing with some amount of trauma, uh, generally speaking, overwhelmed uh, uh, by the, the issues that they're facing. And so our CHWs kind of try to become that executive functioning uh, for the patients to say, we interview them to say, here, here are the, what are the problems? And then we sort them out into these areas to very consciously move them up this uh, ladder here so that we can have them, you know, uh, focus on higher level things as they go up. Um, so after that, uh, uh, physiological needs and psychological needs, then we have the safety needs. A lot of folks where we work with um, uh, our local domestic violence agencies, et cetera. And then um, when we're getting into having all of those needs met, then we're starting to talk about somebody being able to talk about health navigation and education. So uh, we'll go through some examples of this later. But for instance, if somebody is coming in on level one here, uh, they have untreated or uncontrolled diabetes. We're going to do everything we can to uh, uh, treat that uh, as soon as we can or educate about that. But we are very aware of the fact that, that those uh, education sessions are not going to be very effective until we can start moving them uh, up this hierarchy to help them. So that's the general goal here. This is a little bit uh, complicated, but I just want to go through the general workflow here of this so that uh, there is um, some sort of understanding here. Generally speaking, uh, we have a referral pathway here where um, the clinic provides social determinants of health screeners to each of the patients uh, coming in at least once per year. Um, the physicians, nurses, and care managers uh, can all do those social determinants of health screeners at any time. And in addition, they do them at regular intervals. If a patient is identified through that social determinants of health screener, then they can be enrolled for CHW intervention if they choose. In addition, there's a second uh, work plan uh, where uh, patients who are already enrolled in care management and maybe just need some additional health education or, or support can be enrolled that way. But uh, over 90% of our patients are enrolled by that universal social determinants of health screener. Um, when they are uh, enrolled, they are faxed, uh, the patient is faxed over to our CHW, and our CHW is assigned for the needs of the patient. Um, we also do another uh, intake and assessment at this point. So generally speaking, uh, uh, we are finding two to three additional social determinants of health uh, issues that a patient is suffering from when we are going through our um, additional screener there. Um, and this is the first part where a uh, CHW has a pretty unduplicated um, scope of practice. So our CHW can sit down and if it takes an hour and a half to get through that screener and really have an understanding of what that patient is going through, our CHW can do that. Um, very few people in a clinical system have that ability, even among social workers um, who are in high demand. Uh, so then basically, as I said uh, previously, what they're doing is they are then helping that pa patient, it's patient-led, of course, uh, triage that um, uh, list of things that they might be dealing with. So ranging all the way from 
hunger, safety, to uh, managing diabetes or um, preventative mental health uh, interventions. Um, all of those things are uh, ordered and then with the patient uh, 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 triaged into what we will address first. We always have assignments for those patients. Uh, so we make it very clear. This is what the CHW will do. This is what you will do. And this is what we're expecting from um, outside providers. Uh, and so we try to break that down into very um, easy uh, uh, and, and workable small chunks so that we can kind of chip away at whatever it is uh, uh, this patient is suffering from. We have had some patients enrolled in this program for nine months, 10 months at a time, uh, because it takes time to overcome these issues. But as we'll see, it is quite successful in that. The other part of this, as we're seeing here, is that this is a reimbursable service in Minnesota. And so when I'm saying that these, um, these uh, 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 efforts and this scope of practice is unduplicated, it is unduplicated uh, for sure as a reimbursable service. So when you're thinking about how this, this can be structured and how uh, uh, all of this can work, um, everything that I'm talking about within the scope of practice is reimbursable uh, uh, for that. So there is a testing component to this about um, a what percentage of time would be uh, reimbursable and what percentage of the program uh, efforts would be reimbursable. So that's another uh, part of this. In terms of what we're seeing over, this is over a six month period. Um, we have, uh, oh, and this uh, graph flipped here, but we're seeing uh, that a, a large amount of um, uh, uh, things are being solved in each uh, month. Uh, and the, uh, 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 Something's wrong with my graph here, but generally speaking, um, about 70 to 90% of our uh, SDOH uh, uh, issues are solved in, uh, over a course of time. Uh, sometimes that can take uh, a long time. Our average is actually about two months of intervention to cure. Um, so I'll, I'll fix this graph and send it out again. This is obviously not, not correct, but um, it is uh, uh, a, a longer term process. And we see a lot of success with um, some of these issues that have been previously resistant to intervention. So we have a, a whole bunch of folks that have, um, you know, overcome some of these issues that had previously worked with um, social workers or um, other folks uh, uh, in the care sector. Um, a big part of that is, again, this unique scope of practice that CHWs have, where they have more time they have, uh, in some cases, can overcome cultural and linguistic barriers, and they have the ability to really sit with the patients and assist them in overcoming uh, paperwork barriers, for instance, or um, uh, a misunderstanding with a, um, with a, a care uh, provider um, and uh, being able to work um, uh, with them to, to make that work. So it is, um, it, it's, it's quite uh, effective. In terms of uh, over the same six month period, having um, health uh, education and navigation outcomes. So we have achieved 71 out of 82 of those. So pretty high level of success. And these are all going to be people who we've walked up that hierarchy, as I showed earlier, to get to this point. This includes everything from, um, you know, diabetes uh, management education uh, to hypertension education um, to uh, accessing mental health uh, care uh, in this um, uh, system. So uh, these are patient uh, driven and patient identified, um, but the uh, uh, overall picture is, is pretty good on this. Um, and again, they're, they're working on multiple things before they get to this point. One thing that I should note here is that we are payer neutral. So we do have um, folks who are uninsured and undocumented who are um, referred into this program. We serve them like everybody else, but obviously some of these barriers, unfortunately, uh, the ones that we didn't achieve are attributable to that. So uh, uh, there are um, a lot of times, unfortunately, where uh, you know somebody needs a specific um, uh, uh, level of care, and it's very difficult to get that for them if they um, are not able to access the insurance system in this country. Uh, so that is a, a issue. In terms of this, um, our learnings, as I'll show you in a moment, um, workflows really, really matter. Uh, so there are um, huge differences between different workflows. Um, 
there are huge differences in terms of program uh, sustainability and uh, program efficacy. Um, there are, are a very wide array of um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, things that a CHW can do. And so it, it is not a simple um, uh, roadmap to success here. Um, we're hoping that uh, from what we've learned, we can certainly you know, put things together and assist the sector as a whole by giving some tips and tricks. Um, but the, the same general outlines of a program can have wildly different results, um, which is, is uh, somewhat problematic. Um, number two, referrals are cyclical and extremely variable. So when we're talking about addressing these issues with a culturally competent lens, that can be hard uh, when, you know, in terms of agency planning for FTEs or, or um, uh, you know, how their workflows work, when, you know, some weeks you, you might get 50% of your patients uh, that are um, uh, Somali and some for three weeks after that, you may get zero. Um, there, there is uh, a lot of difficulty in planning uh, for that uh, uh, availability in terms of FTEs of cultural competency um, uh, throughout. So having a flexible workforce is, is incredibly important. Um, and the way that we address this is by having multiple programs uh, running at the same time so we can move people around, et cetera. But um, that is something to note in the future, at least in, in our experience, is that there, there is a, it's a very extremely variable um, uh, group of people, uh, also in terms of payer mix, in terms of age, um, it's it's very variable. Uh, in addition, they're cyclical. So generally speaking, we have fewer referrals in the spring uh, by a or by about half uh, actually, um, and we have more in the summer and fall. Um, we've seen that uh, for a few years now. Um, we're not entirely sure why, but that also is an interesting uh, issue that you have to deal with in terms of planning. Uh, in this planning. And then again, uh, CHWs have an unduplicated and extremely helpful scope of practice. So we'll go through some examples of this. In terms of those workflows, as you can see, comparing summer of 22 to spring of 23, so not even a, um, a, a long-term uh, uh, difference in temporally, we see a 500% uh, increase in the projected uh, program cost uh, reimbursable. So according to our cost models, um, running that full program cost in the end, uh, that, excuse me for one moment, uh, that uh, increase uh, is, is um, entirely due to new workflows that were tested and implemented over that time. Um, the jump uh, in that increase was very sudden and sustained and very much due to um, uh, workflow uh, changes. We isolated that variable by starting that workflow with different CHWs at different times, and it follows very easily uh, that, that change. And so that is a um, big increase. In addition, the workflow that we were using in summer 22 was already in a, a major improvement from um, previously. So it is a, a it's a, it's it is not a very structured uh, you know how to of how this you can make this work at the moment. In terms of issues addressed, we also saw a 340 percent increase during this time. Again, tracking with those new workflows. And then meetings per patient also had an increase. So that patient engagement factor, if we can assume that that's a proxy for that. And then patient no call, no show, of course, perhaps also a proxy for that had a 47% decrease over that time period. Again, isolating that variable of the workflow, hopefully. So um, those are big numbers, especially in that reimbursable amount and the SDOH issues addressed. Um, it, is a, it is a very um, uh, interesting, um, problem to have. And it, it is a good thing that CHWs have such a wide and variable um, scope of practice, but it is uh, uh, also a potential problem for people who would like to start programs uh, like this and, and serve patients in this way. In terms of just some, uh, uh, I you know, uh, fleshing out a little bit of, of these um, uh, uh, successes, um, we had uh, a patient uh, that worked with um, uh, one of our CHWs. Uh, Ahmed here is um, a very uh, 
well-educated man. Uh, he has a master's degree, um, but he was resistant to having a diagnostic uh, colonoscopy under the direction of his primary care physician. Um, Ahmed actually um, uh, had a, again, diagnostic colonoscopy, so not a not one that was um, uh, regular. This is due to uh, symptomatic. Our CHW explained the procedure and overcame cultural barriers, um, and Ahmed was able to uh, have that um, uh, procedure and uh, luckily had a good outcome there. Um, we've had multiple patients uh, fit this same mold, actually, in uh, this program. Um, in both the uh, South Sudanese and uh, Somali communities. And um, there was one, I believe, that uh, actually um, uh, was able to uh, address uh, a, a significant issue during that time. I'm not sure if it was uh, how it was coded in the end, but um, it, it, those type of um, barriers do exist and have caused issues for patients in the past. Um, secondarily, as I mentioned previously, we do have patients who are undocumented and we do everything that we can to uh, work through this system that is just not made for them. So um, Rose is a 12 year old girl uh, who is undocumented, um, suffering from a severe abdominal hernia uh, that was preventing her from going to school. Um, so our CHW navigated through three clinical systems and different county agencies to obtain emergency MA and complete the, the procedure. And now Rose is able to go to school every day. Um, so when we're talking about uh, program efficiency, et cetera, um, there is a divergence sometimes between the amount of uh, the program that we can expect to be reimbursed through claims and the um, outcome that we want to see. So this patient here uh, was very complex, took up a lot of resources in order to, to, to solve uh, the issues that she was facing. None of it was reimbursable, right? Um, but that being said, in terms of the outcomes uh, for this patient, it's incredibly large and, and very much, uh, uh, you know, worth the effort put in, obviously. Um, and so that is something where um, even with insured patients, sometimes your most complex patients who have the uh, most to gain from CHW services are also uh, the ones for whom um, make uh, the program a little bit harder to, to sustain financially. Um, there is currently a, a gap there. In terms of um, our referrals, you can see the cyclical nature of the referrals here, and then the SDOH issues uh, that have been started to be addressed. This is uh, indicative of the new workflows that we're seeing. And then overall, again, that cost per patient, um, compared to that, that graph previously, uh, we're starting up around uh, 2,500, and then now we're leveling out around 500, so a major reduction in that cost per patient. In addition, we've got some very uh, extremely varied um, demographic referrals uh, uh, for racial and ethnic demographics. This uh, uh, variance also is uh, reflected in the payer mix, uh, the age of the patients, and um, uh, the language spoken. So all of it is is quite um, different uh, in terms of uh, your week to week. So if you're thinking about this in terms of um, FTEs or in terms of uh, uh, the uh, cultural competencies that you need uh, for your staff, that can change uh, a lot. And um, I'm sure with a greater population size, it may um, uh, uh, equal out a little bit, but it is something to consider that we've experienced over the course of these three years that it is, it is quite variable in this regard. This is just gonna be a case study of um, how all of these things can come together. So again, anonymized uh, with uh, details changed, but we had presenting issue, issues here. So going uh, into the ER monthly for diabetic emergencies, uh, really massive um, medical debt. Uh, starting off, he was uninsured, housing unstable, income um, unstable, um, had cognitive and behavioral um, difficulties uh, that he expressed. Um, we had unresponsive social workers uh, that were not um, working with him because of some of those um, cognitive uh, uh, issues, which is a known issue when you're suffering from uncontrolled diabetes. In addition, he had no local support, so none of his family lived uh, nearby. So our CHW's interventions, uh, with our CHW's interventions, he was able to obtain health insurance uh, and, and uh, obtain disability income. Um, working with the medical team to organize supports for ongoing diabetes self-management, 
and was able to uh, obtain stable housing. So this was a somewhat emergent case. So we, we did start working as best we could on diabetes self-management immediately. But you can see that, that we worked on all of those other issues first to stabilize the social determinant situation so that he would be able to then address the diabetes. Um, and then there are some still issues for sustainability. So a uh, patient can independently meet their own needs uh, and very little is uh, billable. So we've got the situation where this patient um, really needs CHW support to overcome these issues, uh, but very little of this time is billable because this is a new factor. Advocacy from a CHW is not billable. When we were working through these barriers here with this patient, many of them were because we had um, unresponsive uh, social workers or we had to advocate to get this patient what they needed. Um, none of that time is billable. Um, and the patient was unable at first uh, to meet their needs independently. So we were doing a lot of that advocacy. Uh, and so we've had this, this major you know, positive outcome where this patient is now stable and um, has uh, stable both in terms of their social situation and their uh, medical situation. But it was a very difficult um, uh, uh, situation for program sustainability. Again, there's somewhat of a divergence every once in a while. However, in terms of results, uh, there is more than $128,000 in back medical debt covered by an insurer. So that is money that would have been, um, uh, have to be eaten by the um, uh, payer, or not the payer, the clinical systems that we were working with at this time. So we can see that although the billable structure for CHWs right now, maybe not be aligned here, in terms of at least the clinical uh, 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 outcomes there or the clinical um, finances, this is quite helpful. Patient has stable housing, has ongoing insurance coverage, uh, has disability payments, and the patient has not, at the time that uh, we last checked in, been hospitalized for two months. Uh, so that is a major um, success story here in terms of these outcomes. So from there, I'm gonna move on to a completely different program that also utilizes community health workers. Uh, so this is all within the Mankato area, um, but this is a, um, just to, to show the, the vast scope of community health workers, uh, 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 scope of practice in the area. So while we were working with the communities down here, uh, we kept hearing from the Somali community specifically uh, that there was a lack of um, health knowledge in youth and then lack of healthy recreational opportunities. Effectively, what we were hearing was that pa uh, parents in the community um, had a lot of questions about things like um, drug use, alcohol use, vaping, um, exercise, et cetera, uh, that the, they were unsure that their, their kids had uh, access to that, that education, and that they were concerned about their children's mental health a lot of the time. Uh, there was also a lack of healthy recreational opportunities for those kids. So a lot of those kids, uh, their parents are incredibly hardworking. Sometimes both parents are working two jobs, meaning that when those kids come home from school, um, they're on their own for a bit. Um, and what that meant was because these uh, parents were um, uh, new uh, to our area, they didn't really feel comfortable with those kids going outside. So a lot of those kids were sitting uh, uh, with devices inside and not getting enough exercise, which was leading to a, a whole host of problems that the parents were identifying. So we saw this unique sort of need that they were expressing. And, and we heard this um, so many times that we, we just kind of realized that we needed to address this somehow. Uh, so we started meeting uh, once a week in Mankato to um, uh, do a few different things. Uh, we meet at the mo local mosque and we um, serve, uh, at this point we served about 20 children. Um, we provide a healthy meal and a um, uh, health education se uh, session, and then some uh, healthy recreation sessions, some education um, about uh, Somali uh, culture and language, uh, which um, was um, a, 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 it fit something that the parents really wanted and a disconnect between generations um, and some empowerment uh, for those kids that, that is uh, well uh, researched. Then in addition, we did some preventative mental health education. So that doesn't mean that somebody is diagnosed, we're not doing anything else. It is healthy mental habits for those kids. Um, 
there was such a demand that we were able to increase that to two times a week. And then there was a demand from the St. Peter Somali community about 15 miles away. So we increased that to two um, uh, 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 visits per week in St. Peter. So we very rapidly went from a pilot program to a full operation. Uh, we're up to about 52 children served weekly and their parents. And then um, CHWs uh, are used to provide a age and culturally appropriate health education to both the children and the parents. So those um, sessions uh, are billable. Again, this is, of, of course, not every aspect of this program is billable, but those that are are um, uh, billable so that they can do that to help out. Uh, and it is a, a very successful uh, uh, program in that um, the CHW scope of practice is very well aligned to meet the community needs that we're seeing. So it's a different access point. And overall, one of the greatest things about a community health worker is that they are able to um, find and assist patients in so many different access points in community. Um, we're working on you know, a, a multiple different ways to do that. Um, and so it is a, a another unique part of their scope of practice, similar to a social worker, but um, uh, maybe even a little bit more diverse in terms of their ability to do that. Um, we also got a... Uh, lovely partnership from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So the rest of this, I'm just going to show a little bit of the pictures from that. Um, so the Department of Natural Resources came to us. Uh, they translated everything in terms of um, recreation opportunities, uh, fishing um, regulations, hunting regulations, everything. They spent uh, the time and resources to translate all of that into Somali. They provided us with um, uh, multiple different uh, uh, folks from multiple different parts of the agencies, including fisheries and recreation. Uh, they brought all those people down and met with all of our kids from our program and hosted three different sessions as of now. Um, so it has been a really great partnership. And that this was all self-identified through the uh, parents and the children here is that they wanted to get outside. They wanted to learn about fishing. They wanted to learn about hiking um, and that they didn't feel comfortable doing it. And so having these uh, folks from the DNR come down, including conservation officers to explain the laws and having them feel welcome in this in this regard has helped uh, them to to do that and now um, multiple uh, kids in this group are going out uh, uh, fishing um, and uh, recreating outside uh, on a weekly basis and so we can see uh, some of the kids here are are um, experiencing and seeing some of these animals um, this is Craig Supier here, who is the DNR uh, fisheries manager for our region. He personally came and um, made sure that everything was translated and did uh, uh, put on these programs, multiple programs. Um, so they're very uh, uh, invested in this to help um, kids learning about ice fishing. And again, learning how to cast here. So a great event overall. Finally, uh, just my final call to action here. Um, there are some things that we are confident in that will help the sector and help it help our success here be repeatable um, for multiple different uh, populations. So allowing CHWs to bill for patient advocacy, as I pointed out in our previous um, uh, uh, chapter, it's a, it's a huge uh, benefit in terms of their scope of practice that we're seeing. Allowing CHW is in training to bill for services. The extant workforce is not very large. And so at least during that time, while the workforce is being grown, um, it's very difficult to, to, have, to achieve sustainability if you have turnover. Um, and then there is there are caps on the amount of CHW units per month that can be billed. Um, that is difficult for patients who are very medically complex or socially complex uh, to make sure that we're meeting those. And then, of course, increasing reimbursement rates for CHW services is always quite helpful. So that is the end of uh, my presentation here, and I am happy to take uh, questions at this point. Thank you, Evan. Thanks. Our first question is, does the CHW document the social determinants of health needs in electronic medical record? How does they that do. Yes, so they are uh, documenting a um, uh, their both the social determinants of health needs interventions and uh, uh, the health needs and interventions in an EMR. Um, and that is uh, everything we had to develop um, uh, to be custom made for this program. Um, and so, and to be custom made in order to be 
build for CHW services. Uh, so it, it is not a plug and play system at this point, um, but it is not a huge lift either. Thank you. Related to your call to action, what kind of caps are there? How much time? Great question. It is um, four units uh, per uh, uh, day for 24 hour period and then 24 uh, units per month. And so both of those can be problematic for patients who um, are uh, uh, complex in any way. And um, it is a, um, it's sort of an artificial cap in terms of, of how that's been laid out. Certainly in terms of the way CHWs were used in the past, perhaps that wouldn't have been an issue, but um, it is a, it is, it is a, um, in terms of the ways that CHWs are being used now, it is a, a, a definitely a hindrance to some programs. Is billing for commercial insurance or just Medicaid? There are um, a few payers in Minnesota who have expanded the benefit uh, to um, uh, their commercial insurance, uh, but generally speaking, it is uh, Medicaid uh, insurance. So there, there is uh, talk about that. And that's one thing that we um, have advocated for is that many of the patients that we're seeing are commercial patients. And there's this assumption that um, if somebody is suffering from um, a difficulty in medical navigation or a difficulty in uh, uh, their um, uh, you know, kind of medical journey went because of social determinants of health needs that they will automatically be a Medicaid patient and that could not be further from the truth. Um, in terms of our referrals, uh, about 25% of our referrals are commercial patients uh, from week to week. So it is very important that this be advocated for and thought of as a um, universal benefit. Evan, what per, was that percent? Did you say 20 some percent? 25% on 25%. average. Quite variable, wow. but on about 25%. That's great. That was my suspicion. So you hit it pretty solid that everybody assumes that they're Medicaid or uninsured, but these cultural and ethnic uh, differences create barriers even to commercially insured population. Very helpful. Absolutely. And it's not just the cultural and ethnic barriers as well, or written linguistic barriers as well. It is, it is very much the social determinants uh, needs as well. We've had commercial patients who have been suffering from um, uh, housing instability. We've had commercial patients who are suffering from um, food instability, food insecurity. It is it is not a clear category in terms of um, the way that sometimes it's thought of. So uh, definitely, definitely not a um, uh, a clear cut line between the, the needs of Medicaid and commercial patients. So do you talk about the training done in CHWs, kind of the process for folks getting the certificate, how that is paid for? Yeah, yeah. So there is a um, certificate program that is run through uh, community colleges and universities, uh, multiple of them in Minnesota. It is a uh, nine to, I think most have ever seen it as 16 month program uh, in terms of how it's laid out. Uh, it's it's quite intensive and it is um, uh, a varying expense. So uh, if we, and, and taking a step back, the workforce here of people who have um, that certification is very, very low. Uh, so in the Mankato area, um, it is uh, perhaps, you know, a single digits. So we are having to develop a lot of those folks and that's gonna be the way that it is uh, across the sector. That is going to be a major problem for expanding these um, uh, learn learnings into uh, the the future. There are a few different ways that um, uh, that has been. We're going to move forward with that. So uh, the Minnesota CHW Alliance has uh, a, a large amount of scholarships that are available for at least a partial scholarship. Um, I see someone in the chat is sharing that, which is great. Uh, and then there, there are um, other workforce uh, uh, investments that are being made either through companies or through um, uh, uh, government agencies to assist in getting people through that program. But generally speaking, the scale of that is, in my opinion, not what it would be need to be in order to um, easily launch and grow these programs 
uh, in order to take advantage and grow the sector to where I think it could be and uh, uh, help patients in all these various different ways that it could be. Um, and so that is my really big concern is that even if we find a way for this to be sustainable or mostly sustainable financially through um, claims-based billing, which would be great, uh, if we do that and, and, and then this could be repeatable, we could have many different agencies, many different partners with a culturally or, or geographically specific lens, use these same um, interventions to do really great things across the state. But if there isn't an extra workforce, uh, those um, efforts will not be able to get off the ground and um, it will be very difficult. So there are some barriers to this, but I just really wanna stress that there, if, if everything could work out, there's a world in which every, you know, culturally, linguistically, or geographically specific agency that wants to take on some of these task, tasks and serve people who are traditionally marginalized could very easily, you know, make this happen and, and use this benefit to, to um, really assist people in need in a way that they aren't getting now. So again, it's unduplicated workflow. So that is my goal here is that in the end of this project, uh, you know, anybody could could hopefully be able to pick this up and run with it and do something good for people who need it. Um, but there are a lot of barriers to that right now that we're trying to smooth out. Yeah, thank you. It is a lot of uh, first pancakes, I bet. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a question in the chat about uh, connections with other organizations. How many organizations are connected? the CHW hub and kind of what efforts do you have to continue to work with more organizations? Absolutely. So uh, in terms of referral partners that we have, um, some sort of like expedited uh, uh, or um, uh, like workflow worked out with, uh, there are about 35 partners uh, that are mostly area social service agencies. Um, that doesn't mean that we accept referrals from them, but it certainly does mean that we um, uh, can more quickly access services for our patients or have some sort of workflow to, to, to assist with, with that. So that is um, uh, certainly a, a, a benefit. Could you speak some about evaluation in the Somali Youth Program? Evaluation the small youth program. Yeah, how is it being evaluated? Yeah, so there there are a few metrics by which we're evaluating. Um, part of the issue is, is for that program is actually uh, that there has been a um, not a lot of interest in additional funding for that program. So we don't have a lot of uh, funding for evaluation. Um, we uh, are doing it. Um, I, I hope uh, I'm in a room full of MPHs, so I, I hope that we're, uh, you guys don't uh, uh, think too poorly of our um, uh, methods here. But um, we're just doing uh, entry and um, uh, periodic uh, uh, surveys of um, both what uh, the children and parents want to see and some of the accomplishments that we're seeing. So in terms of uh, reported screen time, self-reported screen time, we like to see that go down. Uh, in terms of recreation opportunities, we're gonna hopefully be able to see that go up. In terms of knowledge, uh, self-identified uh, knowledge of some of the issues that we are um, seeing, we're hoping that uh, that is gonna go up. And then we have a general question about mental well-being, which is um, a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, self-identified subjective metric by which uh, those kids can do that. So quite uh, uh, imprecise, but but hopefully in the future, we'd be able to study that a little bit more. And really long-term would be a uh, the way that we want to study that because these are, you know, a lot of preventative and um, early uh, uptake interventions. So, And I will ask, I know the answer to this question, because there's folks on here who might know students. Um, how have you like engaged students as interns? Is that something you do? Students as interns in, for the Somali Youth Program? or Just generally? in general. Are you yeah, looking for so, anyone to help out with anything? Absolutely. So, so we have uh, in our evaluation of, which is much more robust, of the project uh, well-being uh, project, we had a, a 
amazing intern who uh, was an MPH student and who just graduated. His name was uh, Michael Van Skiba. Um, I can't speak highly enough about um, what he was able to accomplish. Uh, so there's a lot of needs in terms of uh, evaluation and also in terms of ideation of some of these things. Um, there's a uh, uh, you all know this, but a, a very wide scope of practice also for folks uh, going through different MPH programs. And so if there were uh, opportunities for uh, folks in those programs who um, may be taking a track uh, of um, uh, a little bit more of an administrative track, we definitely need uh, cooks in the kitchen to assist in um, taking some of that data and seeing how we can improve workflows, seeing how we can improve patient outcomes, um, all that kind of stuff. So everyone knows Michael, who he was just talking about, won uh, the best poster award at our annual conference recently. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, how is cost covered for advocacy services? Where does that funding come from? And do you utilize any grant funds? Yeah, it's not. So we utilize grant funds for that. Uh, it is um, a, it, it's, it's very, um, uh, difficult uh, because it's so variable in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, differences in how much advocacy is a percentage of the time we're spending per month. Um, it's very it's seemingly random and quite variable and so it's it's hard to predict. Um, if if for instance you launch a program and you take your first three months and then base a cost model off that of how much grant funding you'll need, that could be wildly different by quarter three of that year. So it is it is a, a, a problem. It's not consistent in that regard. Um, but yeah, it's it's all, all of that is grant funding. We are not anywhere near 100% funded in any of our programs uh, through just uh, reimbursements at this point, although we're making steady improvements. So I know we're getting a little close to time. So I'm wondering, if there was one takeaway you wanted all the folks here <laughs> to leave with, what would that be? Yeah, thank you. It it would really be that this has potential, uh, and it has potential to directly and effectively address um, a wider range of issues uh, uh, that are being suffered by traditionally marginalized communities in our state, and that if we can work together to create change and figure some of these things out, it would be very easy to both empower patients and empower, you know, local cultural organizations or, or uh, community-led efforts to overcome some of the issues that these communities are identifying themselves as being most um, problematic and uh, distressful for them. So I, I, Having worked in in doing this, you know, day in and day out, and evaluating it and running the program, so I I handle both the evaluation for the local program and um, the uh, uh, day to day administration for it. And you know, it, there there have been uh, tough times in creating workflows and all that, but I really do see that this could be a a um, somewhat of a silver bullet in terms of uh, addressing health inequities in Minnesota. And so I. There is a long road to travel, as has been expressed here, but I really want people to hopefully leave with that hope that um, there is a, a really positive potential outcome here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Last chance if anyone has a final question. <laughs> uh. Would you be fine, Evan, if we included your work email in the email we'll send out? Okay, awesome. Yeah, happy to do that. All right. Thank you so, so, so much. I have Thank just, you, everybody. Yeah, I have just a couple closing things for us. First off, June is a very busy <laughs> month for us. This week has been a lot of uh, events as well. Um, we do have another event this evening. Our Health Equity Committee is hosting uh, Dr. Stephanie Barrage and Magdalia Loyola from the governor's office to talk about equity and community engagement at the state level. Um, you could find information to register for that on our website. 
We also have the next presentation in our community organization spotlight series Tuesday. I was like, when is June 20th? Um, and that's going to be uh, featuring Touchstone Mental Health. And if you did not know, um, Minnesota Public Health Association is a member of the Great Lakes Public Health Coalition. There's like many levels within <laughs> the American Public Health Association. And uh, our colleagues with us are hosting a very interesting looking webinar about climate trends in Great Lakes communities. And that will be June 27th. We also have committee meetings and there's July events. So please check out our events on our website. You can follow us on our social media is another great way to keep in uh, touch with us and know what we're up to. We will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this presentation with this recording, the resources people have shared in the chat, Evan's email. Um, if you didn't make it to the first uh, event that we did on community health workers with the Minnesota CHW Alliance, that recording is also on our website as well if you're interested. If you are part of the CHW ecosystem uh, and have, you know, a desire to do a presentation, talk about some, you know, informative, cool, interesting, challenging, you know, whatever thing related to CHWs. MPHA has been a long time supporter of the field and we're really looking to raise awareness um, and advocate for the role that CHWs can have addressing health disparities in our state. So I will put my email <laughs> in the chat if you're interested in doing another presentation uh, with us. And with that, I will stop the recording and say thank you again so much, Evan, for taking the time to connect with us and talk about all of your work. Thank you have, very much, guys. Have a good day, everybody.